Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome to our webinar. We're excited to share some ideas with you guys on uh, networking in a virtual world, but we're going to make it pretty interactive this morning too. So we're going to ask for input and people's ideas on some things um, and we'll just kind of see where it goes. So if you don't, uh, we'll just do quick introductions with the Velocity team, just in case you don't know us. I'm Brooke Page Thompson. Um, I oversee all the learning and, and content for Velocity and do some consulting facilitation as well. And then I've got Dan, do you wanna introduce yourself? Uh, Dan Soberg, uh, uh, President of Velocity and uh, do lots of things. And we have Lauren on the phone as well. Um, and she's part of our team. She's gonna help um, just take some notes and coordinate for us today and be part of the, the dialogue. So we'll go ahead and jump right in and get started. So for today's session, what we're gonna cover is, uh, we've got a, a couple topics. So we wanted to talk about networking and why it's important, because um, obviously you all are here for some reason about learning more about how to network uh, within your communities and groups. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about traditional ways of networking. So pre-COVID, we did some, some big things with networking. It kind of became a beast all on its own and then COVID kind of stopped that. So we wanna talk about what were some traditional ways that we used to network that probably will come back at some point, but what are some new ways of networking as well? So now that we have this virtual world, it's changing how we connect with each other and how we build relationships. So just a little bit of some tips and tricks on how to do that. And then we're just gonna really quickly talk about how the birds, if any of you have seen the birds before with Velocity, um, there is some telltale signs on how they show up in a networking event or just in communication. So we're gonna take you through that very quickly and then any Q&A. So if you have any um, thoughts or things you wanna interject along the way, please feel free to unmute or put it in the chat box and we'll be happy to um, talk through it. Any questions before I get started? Thumbs up, okay, good. <laughs> the beauty of Zoom, we get the thumbs up. So let's start with just a quick question. So you can put it in the chat box or you can um, unmute yourselves and talk through this, but we just wanna talk about, if you think about what are your goals for 2021? And it can be goals for networking, it can be goals for building different relationships, or it can be goals just for your professional career in general. Uh, but what are some goals that you have for 2021? Let's see, do more about less, <laughs> more focus. Good, Janet. What else? What are some other goals that people have for 2021? Reach out to markets for velocity. Uh, continue to expand network even when in-person meetings and events aren't as practical. Yeah, John, that's I think that's a great, it's a great goal. So for me, Brooke. I sometimes will like, you know, I still get, I don't love networking and I'll get nervous depending on like who I'm talking to. I find online, like it's easier for me to avoid it mm. because I just like, I'm not in person having to interact directly. And so yeah. like getting better at, you know, being able to make those connections authentically, no matter, mm. you know, the context. Mm -hmm. Authentic relationships. Yeah, it's, um, we're going to talk a little bit about, especially if you have dove tendencies or are an introvert by nature, networking events <laughs> pre-COVID were very challenging for some of us. So um, we'll talk about, a little bit more about that too, but that's good insight. Um, anything else on goals for 2021? I know one of mine is more balance just in general on how I do things and um, who I spend my time with and how much time I, I insert on certain things. And I think pre-COVID, we, we got really good at stretching ourselves really thin, especially when it came to networking events. You felt like you had to go to a lot of things, especially if you were a leader or ran a practice of any kind in a consulting firm, you, you needed to go out in the market and start talking to people. And 
that could be very exhausting for some. And I think we've been given a gift in some regards that we've kind of slowed down a little bit, but there's still a lot of value in building a network and relationships. And so that kind of leads into the next question we wanted to ask you, which is, and it kind of tees up to what Lauren was talking about, um, how can building genuine relationships help achieve those goals? So when you think about networking, do you think about networking as building relationships or as just creating a book of contacts? So this is, you know, this is always a, an interesting topic to me because on the one hand, networking itself can seem contrived. Like we do it for an objective reason. We want to, as I put in, you know, want to grow a market uh, or build a book of business. And then that can get a little sticky because you're meeting a human being and you should have natural curiosity for another person and getting to know them as, as such, not just as a tool to achieve some objective objective that you have. And so this is the, I think what makes networking um, uncomfortable for people because of its, if its contrived nature. But the reality is that it is through genuine relationships when you have genuine curiosity about people and what they're about and where they're going and how they're handling this, this world that we live in, that trust gets built. And yes, your objective goals are more likely to be met when you build genuine emotional trust with um, new people that that you meet. And so to me, that's a, always like an interesting uh, a paradox, if you will, how, how to bridge that, the contrived notion versus the genuine relationship building uh, side mm -hmm. of it. Yeah, for me, it's both, it's both contacts and relationships because sometimes contacts can connect you with other people who might turn into relationships. So there's a little bit of volume and a little bit of, of uh, there's a little bit of quality and quantity, I suppose you'd say. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're building a list, that's one thing. If you're looking for who can I collaborate with or who do I really have strong, like adjacent work with, the, you know, there's those people, and then there's all the other people who are sort of peripherally relevant. But um, mm -hmm. but all those card capture events are kind of gone. <laughs> yeah. So you know, it's uh, which is perfectly fine with me because <laughs> I never do anything with all those business cards anyway. So you know. Yeah. Yeah. I read a I read an article that said I think it was on average 70 percent of those networking events lead to zero new contacts for most people because typically if you're part of a networking community you all go to the same events you all have similar interests so you see the same people everywhere you go and you tend to gravitate to who you know because it's easier and it's very rare that genuine relationships come out of those it, it is more of a card gathering process and, and maybe you build a connection at some point but it's it's rare that at, at those events that there was much that came out of them other than maybe a couple drinks and you got to know about someone's kayaking trip right so <laughs> they were they're very interesting to say the least so to Dan's point about being curious about people that's why relationships if we kind of frame this as less about networking and more about um, deepening relationships within existing networks or contacts that we have, that really is what networking is. It's what it's becoming um, because we are limited in how we go out into the market, how we can interact with people. I think Dylan mentioned that, like you can't, the, the in-person stuff just isn't working anymore. So how do we do this more effectively and do it in a way that's meaningful for both us and the people that we're reaching out to? So let's... Um, just a quick look on what the definition of networking is. This is pretty benign, but um, if you think about it, it's an action or process of interacting with others to exchange information or develop personal relationships or contacts. Um, it's just, a, it's a way to think of it a little bit differently. It's a, it, we're exchanging information. It's not so much about me selling a service to you. It's more collaborating on what we can share collectively together. And maybe there's something that we can innovate on or um, do a little bit differently as a, as a collective. But I think, Dan, this was one of your definitions on the bottom. Networking is an intentionalized approach to meeting yeah. people. 
Yeah, I, I look at networking as an opportunity to see what's possible. And you intentionalize uh, serendipity, if you will, because mm -hmm. you don't know what's possible until you go out there. Uh, but you have to intentionalize it in the first place in order to actually show up at a networking event that maybe you have mixed feelings about. And mm -hmm. so when we can uh, screw up the courage to do that, if it's difficult for us to do, uh, then we get to see what's possible because the chances are pretty good. You're going to be surprised when you get there. You're going to have a conversation you weren't expecting to have. And that's, uh, you know, that's how great things happen. Mm -hmm. How many of you used opportunities on airplanes when you used to fly places to make connections or network? Did anybody do that? Janet, you did? Yeah. Yep. I used I used to use flights as an excuse to put my headphones on and get away from whatever client work I had to do so I could just be heads down working on stuff. Um, but when I would actually take my headphones off and talk to whoever was sitting next to me, the conversations were really interesting. Um, sometimes you could get some really meaty nuggets of things. And um, I think, Dan, we've made some good clients out of conversations that have happened on airplanes. So it, that, while that's not part of what we really have right now, um, it's these little moments of opportunity where you may not think it's a networking moment, but it really is because we just have to open up our, our span of thinking to say, maybe I, if I talk to this person, something different will come out of it. And it's, it's kind of stepping out of your comfort zone for some of us to, to actually do that. Does anybody else have any thoughts on what a definition of networking is for you? Like, what does it mean to you? I think about it like you're building a professional support network with people you vibe with. <laughs> like, mm. I mean, doing work and collaborating with other people, I feel like is best when, you know, you kind of are on the same page and again, like being genuine and authentic and we can feel when that's not happening. Mm -hmm. So even if, even if like I've met someone that might be a super, or might be a valuable contact, you know, once you get to a point where you can tell that isn't being built, being able to like, you know, focus on the right relationships. Mm -hmm. I like that. One, one thing I do and I recommend to the attorneys I work with is actually thinking of, instead of thinking of things as networking and kind of the limits that might have in people's minds, thinking of it as helping. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what can I do to help somebody today? You know, presumably down the line, hopefully they can help me. But if you think of yourself as a helpful person, because most people do want to help others um, mm -hmm. in different ways. And so, well, you can't help people unless they know you. Um, and so if you go into that, you know, looking for networking opportunities because you want to help new people, then that can maybe kind of provide that positive influence for folks. Yeah, that's great. I love that. Yeah, how can I help? I like that a lot. So let's move on to why do we do it? Like whoever came up with this concept of networking is like a thing to do, right? So why are some reasons we do it? I know Neil just said, you know, if you look at it more for help from helping people, but if we, we take it in the context of pre-COVID, there, um, there was definitely momentum around these big networking events. And there was some, I think, pressure that people felt to go to events and try and build a book of business that way. And, and the more you did it, the more you learned that maybe it wasn't the most effective use of your time sometimes. But why, why are some reasons that we do it? I'll give you one. When we invest in relationships, it pays back in dividends. Why else do you think we network? Um, to grow. To grow. Mm -hmm. We don't grow. grow in a vacuum. We grow in, in relationships with other people. Yep, and grow how, Dan? Well, in, in both professionally and personally. Because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the quality of our lives is, is, is determined by the quality of our relationships. So to the extent that we seek out healthy relationships, whether they be professional or personal, uh, we grow. We grow as people and we grow as professionals. Mm-hmm. 
And for me, I always learn things. I hear what people, I gather information. You know, mm. I find out what's going on, what people are thinking about, and that becomes currency because then I have interesting things to talk about with other people. Mm. And I just like my antenna is up yep. and just hearing and, and learning from other people. So that's, mm -hmm. that's how I get myself geared up to do it. <laughs> like, oh, what can I learn? <laughs> Maybe this won't be so bad. <laughs> Well, and, and to that vein, like, and then sometimes when you would talk to multiple people, you would hear similar threads and all of a sudden you start to see trends of how mm -hmm. people are feeling in the marketplace or what, what they're struggling with from a business standpoint. It's, it's not so much you, you read it or researched it. It's like, you're hearing it from real people right? and finding solutions to help problem solve potentially with those individuals. Mm-hmm. Right, or bounce something off them, say, hey, I'm thinking about using this tool or, or do you, you know, what's your best source of research on X or yep. something? Yep, that's great. It's potentially lifelong career development, right? It's, um, it's something that I know from networks that I've gone, networking events I've gone to or people that I've connected with have given me information or ideas on different jobs that I could have in the future or help connect me to someone um, or been a mentor, like an ad hoc mentor I didn't even know I needed or wanted at the time. But then I realized they had a skill set that was really powerful that I'd, I'd love to, to know more about. Um, so it could be lifelong career development it does give you a competitive edge um, because if you start to expand your network, you're, you're helping connect other people to, to each other. And so you're, you're getting a little bit of a competitive edge here on how you, um, how broad of a span that you have and the, and the reach that you have in the marketplace. Improve skill sets. You can stay on top of industry trends, uh, meet prospective mentors, partners, and clients, and then make social connections and potentially lifelong friends. Not every networking event turns into that, but um, sometimes you, you can go really deep. And I think prior to COVID, th that was a little bit harder. And what we're going to talk about here with tips and tricks for going into 2021, um, how maybe some of those connections can be a little bit deeper and the value that that brings from a networking standpoint. So why is it important? We kind of covered this a little bit in the last slide, but it's an ability to exchange information. Just like what Janet said, um, we're able to share, especially because networking typically starts with something common. Uh, we all have a common interest in why we're there. So if, if you're in the HR space, there's typically lots of, you know, ATDs, one of the networking groups that you can be part of and they do virtual stuff, they do stuff in person. Um, but typically you find that there's a common interest in something and people that are there are like-minded and maybe have similar thoughts or concepts or thinking through things just like you are. Um, it's a way to advance thought leadership. So just like you were saying, Janet, I've used my network a ton to say, hey, I've heard this in the market. Are you seeing this in your industry? Um, and just starting to get ideas on how to advance some of the thought leadership that comes out of what velocity takes to the market in the future. Some of it comes from what I'm hearing in my network and just staying connected to people from a relationship standpoint. It widens your relationships. I guess it depends on if you want widened relationships or not. Maybe some people are okay with a little smaller circle and others are looking for, you know, we talked to a guy who had 12,000 people in his network. I can't even begin to comprehend 12,000 people. Now, granted, they're probably not all like close friends of this individual, but um, just that thought of 12,000 people is, is a little daunting to me, but a couple hundred sounds about right <laughs> for probably the things that I want to do. So I think everyone's got a little different bend on how wide they want their relationships to go. Um, you can share best practices and recommend people for other roles. I've, I've, use my network to send connection points when I know that someone's looking for a role or a job or looking for a culture change in an organization. And I, and I know a culture that might be a good fit. Um, it's a really easy connection point to say, hey, I'd like to introduce the two of you. You take it from here, but at least I've made the connection and I trust both of you to you know, do what you need to do with this. So it helps you build better communication skills. 
Why on earth would networking help you create better communication skills? Well, a few reasons. Um, it forces you to tell your story. Uh, mm. it, it, you really don't have any choice but to uh, uh, go to places that might seem uncomfortable at first, but then become more comfortable over time. Mm -hmm. And so perhaps you're up for a promotion in a few months. <clears throat> and the question is, why should we put you in this role? Well, because you went to a couple of networking events and kind of got used to listening to yourself talk about what you're passionate about and what you do well, that enables you to communicate in that interview mm -hmm. for a promotion or maybe for a new job with, um, with more ease. Uh, most people are not that comfortable talking about themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, they much rather talk about what they do than who they are. Mm -hmm. And networking forces you to go there. And that's very helpful in your career as you're trying to make the case for either greater responsibility or a new position. Mm -hmm. I like that. Any other thoughts on what it, how does it, what does it do for communication? If you're forced to talk to someone that you don't yeah, know, it, what does it do? It also opens some channels because if you, uh, so or habits, because if you meet somebody, the idea is you, if, if you're interested, you know, you follow up mm -hmm. and you keep in touch. And so there's the content piece. Here's the story. Here's what I'm interested in. Here's what I offer. Here's, you know, and asking them what they're interested in. But there's also the how do you do that going forward? There's a channel yep. habits thing that comes out of that. That's part of the skills, I think. Yeah. Sure. It is a skill. Yeah. And, and Dan brought this up, but it provides you a chance, again, to tell your story, find your value. It, it gets you out of this mindset of having to tell a really elaborate story and honing in on the pieces that are the most relevant. And then that becomes the story that you consistently tell over and over again. Uh, maybe it evolves as you evolve, but I, I don't know about you, but I, if you got stuck in a conversation with someone who would just go on and on and on about things, and it was like, I just needed the Cliff Notes version. I didn't need the full book. Um, you start to get really good the more you do it to understand like, here are the key points that you need to understand. And then that's what you use to Dan's point. If you're interviewing for a job or um, positioning yourself in the market, you're, you're really clear on who you are and what you wanna share with the world. And, and that becomes powerful too, because it's no longer, it's not a sales pitch. It's a relationship building discussion. And it, it's, it's sharing a part of who you are with others that, and sometimes it's, it's, I always love it when people have a little bit of vulnerability in their story. Not a lot. Like I don't need to know all the, the dark corners of your life, but a little bit of vulnerability of, yeah, you know, I had that job and it, it, it was really tough, but this is what I learned from it, or this is how I've grown from this. And to, to see that in other people helps you feel vulnerable when, when sharing your story with others. So that's a little bit on why it's important. So pre-COVID, we talked a little bit about this. I won't spend too much time here, but what what did we do pre-COVID to network? We went to rubber chicken events. <laughs> went to rubber <laughs> chicken events. <laughs> who who went to conferences? Like flew to Florida to go to some three day conference that then had a mandatory networking event after every every day session that. You just, for me, I cringed at those. I stayed in my room as long as I could. And then I like popped down for five minutes just to say I went. Yeah. How many liked that kind of stuff? Was there anyone that enjoyed those kinds of events? Do we have any extroverted well, parrots? <laughs> well, it, it was, I enjoyed it if the, if the speakers were good. Mm -hmm. you, you want one of two things. You either want the speakers to be good or the, or the, the networking itself to meet interesting people to be good. If you can get yep. one out of two, because you know the food's not going to be good. Uh, <laughs> if you get one out of two, then I'm, you know, for me, I'm happy. Yeah, to that point, I like, you know, I like to learn something or a lot of things when I go to these conferences. So whether it's the speakers or the breakout sessions. And I find like that's one thing I did like is when 
there were breakout sessions or you were with smaller groups, it was easier to get to like you experience, you got to practice more of those soft skills. And to your point on the previous slide, like get to the why, not just the what. And mm -hmm. so that's what I did like about it. I always felt they were too long though. Yeah. I'm tired. Crammed agendas. Mm -hmm. Crammed agendas. So we, we flew to places to go to networking events that were part of conferences. We traveled around town. Did anybody here have to block like a whole half of a day for an external networking event just to make sure you could get there in time and home in time and just, just the coordination of getting to and from certain places sometimes was a little daunting. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe. I mean, that's sort of the monthly professional association chapter events, you know, the, mm -hmm. the various club kind of events. I live outside of Boston and I have to get in somehow. Yeah. If it's nighttime in my car, I'm more likely to do that. Then I pay $40 to park mm -hmm. and then I have to drive home. It's an hour each way. And yeah, you're right, Brooke. It's, it's, a, com it's a huge commitment and mm -hmm. you've spent all this money and you're already kind of annoyed, at least if you're me. Um, so, you know, hopefully you can get a drink or two and then, and then you meet somebody good, hopefully. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it was a big commitment. And, and, and in a geographically defined universe, you know, you're, you're, that's, I'm a member of a, of a club and we've expanded our programming to invite people who are much more far flung. And it's been really, really great. Yeah. That was going to be a question for you, Janet, that I had was um, if you if you've, you know, are still a part of those situations or organizations after COVID and if you've seen a shift in their like usefulness since everything's online and you don't have to deal with all of that stuff or. Yeah, uh, Lauren, for me, uh, both. There's one group that I'm part of that. Um, they've gone online, of course, but it's topic specific and the topics are not as relevant to me. Mm. And then networking is, is not as well organized online. They haven't really adapted that well. Then there's another one, this other one that I'm part of that I actually do a lot of volunteer work with on programming has just aced it. You know, there's so much more programming going on so you can pick and choose what works for you and different formats, you know, highly structured, not structured, speed networking on, in breakout groups, interesting prompt question, you know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So yes and no, I would say, and this is where you see organizations like sort themselves out. They're either good at it and they've adapted well or not. And so, yep. you know, when things kind of go back, it makes you wonder, what will you do? Yeah, what, what's going back and what's staying? Yeah. So if you think about what types of things we did to, to network, what, what did we find worked well? Like what are some things that we actually hope come back once we're all able to travel and, and do all these external things again? Is there anything about those events that you're like, yeah, I miss that. I wish, I, I want that to come back in some form or fashion. For me, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, for me, I just, some form of in-person interaction, mm -hmm. I think would be nice to have again. At least some of the time, like I definitely um, have found a lot of value in like the virtual um, experiences, but I've, I've found like stronger relationships um, faster in person, so. Yep. Yeah, that's a great point, Lauren. I mean, we're all at this point, a year into this, we're a little, we could use some human interaction. Um, most of us are pretty zoomed out and screened out at this point. Uh, and, and the nuance of relationship building will, will, will be fresh. I mean, because it is a, a better connection when you're in the same space, physical space with another person having a conversation. It is qualitatively better than having that same conversation via screen. And a lot of us are going to rediscover that uh, and younger professionals are, are going to really feel it. 
feel the difference because mm -hmm. you know, they graduated into a world where this is the norm. <laughs> so when they get to actually go to networking events, they're going to be like, oh, this is better. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. And I think we've talked a lot about what was the hardest, the, the travel, there was a cost associated. I think a lot of that's going to, you know, possibly look a little bit different if we do go back in person, just what are people willing to, to do and not do at this point? And so I, I think we'll see some good shifts come back, but um, that was pre-COVID networking. We talked about most of these, but just really quick recap, whoops. We spent a lot of time traveling. You'd, most time you didn't know people, often turned into a sales pitch. I know for me, that was that was a big thing. Like it, rather, even if, even if it, they marketed as non-sales, you always had like those two salespeople that would find you and start talking about, hey, I run this thing and I've got this product. You should definitely try. Here's my card. And you're like, thanks. I'm going to go over here and talk to this person. Um, lots of physical business cards. I don't know about you, but I was horrible at inputting contact data into my database. They just sat in a box. And if I was lucky to have an, an admin to help me, I might remember to give them to her or they might be stuck in a pocket somewhere and I'd find them three years later. It's just, you know, the, the physical card thing was always fun. Have you heard and then, of the digital ones? Can you like, like tap QR. your phones? Yeah, so, or you have a QR code on the paper and so they just scan it and then your contact and LinkedIn are automatically there. Best of oh, both. Digital world. <laughs> And then I don't know about you guys, but I barely remembered who I talked to or what I talked about by the end of them. When I came home, I was like, I don't really know what happened or where I was, but I'm glad to be home. Especially let's the talk big ones. Yeah, the big ones were tough. So let's talk about networking in a virtual community. When, when this concept first kind of popped into your, your preview, what was your initial reaction? Was it a little something like, how am I going to do this? What does it look like? And I think for the first half of the quarantine of 2019 or 2020, um, most of us just kind of hunkered down and didn't really think about networking, right? Because we didn't know where this was going to go or what it was going to look like. And things just kind of came to a halt. And then as we progressed into 2020 and then now into 2021, I think we're starting to, to come to this realization of it's still going to be some time before we probably are in person for networking events, but we still need to grow our portfolios and our businesses in a way that's unique and different. But how do we do that if we don't have these natural networking opportunities that that kind of happen on a monthly basis or a quarterly basis how do we even start doing it so we want to talk a little bit about that today um did you do any networking in 2020 did anybody do any networking in 2020 and if you did what what did you do not events i didn't do any events <clears throat> any networking that I did was one on one. And was it with new contacts or was it with existing contacts? Um, it was it was from referrals. Mm -hmm. yeah. so it was it was just all one on one referral, which kind of suits me. Mm -hmm. I actually prefer it. Um, so I didn't mind it that much. Mm -hmm. Do you ask for those referrals directly, or do they just flow to you? Um, both. I've gotten better over time at asking for referrals. It's not natural to me, uh, but it is an appropriate uh, uh, favor to ask to someone who already trusts you and, and knows that you provide value. There's nothing inappropriate about it. Uh, but yeah, I've been fortunate to have some flow my way. And, and in 2020, I, I, I was a little more assertive in asking for it, asking for referrals. And Dan, on, on that point, my experience is that people who, who know you and appreciate you love to help. They just don't know how right. until, you, until you tell them. That's what I tell my daughter. I'm like, honey, people, 
people are, they, they love you. They, they respect you. They're impressed with you. They want to help, but you have to make it easy for them. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Couldn't that say kind of goes, point. It kind of goes to Dan's topic on, you know, telling your story. It's, it's finding out how to tell not just what you do, but why are you important and sharing that with other people, not in a egotistical way, but just like, Hey, I, this is what I can help you with. And I think Neil said it too. How can I help? Um, if you, if you don't know how to ask or share that information with people, it, they don't really know what to do. They want to help, but they don't know how. Hey, before we move on, uh, Dylan, Dylan put in LinkedIn. So do you mind telling mm -hmm. us a little how you did that? Dylan. Oh, sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. A lot of it just came from me finding connections through my previous jobs, finding, let's say, a supervisor or even coworkers that I worked with, and then building off of their relationships to just deepen mine, even if it was just a quick, hi, hello, how are you doing? And then it would develop more into deeper relationships as I would carry on the conversations with them, even through LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the current LinkedIn connections that I've made, I've actually built into an opportunity for a new position coming up that I have lined up. Wow. wow. That's fantastic. So Dylan, how long did it take you to get from, from texting back and forth or emailing to a phone conversation? Like, was that a big shift or did that not happen? It wasn't necessary? It didn't take me so long. It took me under a month. Um, Time-wise, I don't think that's a very long time to develop that kind of relationship. Mm -hmm. But once my mind is kind of set to it, I'm very persistent on, okay, well, I know where I want to go. How do I get there? And I would just continue to build on that as quickly as I could and try to network as much as I could. Because this year, with no conferences or anything, and I'm kind of in that gap. Um, I'm kind of one of the younger ones where I did not get to go to many conferences, sadly, before everything hit that mm. I kind of had to grow and network just off of LinkedIn or Zoom, all of these lovely little features that we're having to do now. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. I found velocity through networking on LinkedIn this year you did. I, yeah I had someone um locally I think he's locally um asked to join my network said that we like we serve similar clientele and just looking for opportunities to expand and a lot of times with those I feel are salesy but this one felt like I loved how he kind of worded it I'm like yeah awesome and then like two days later he shared the job post and it was through that post that I was connected with you guys and it's just like you never know where something's going to come from and I think that's the important thing is like the more you're growing and like putting yourself out there in the different places you know it's easier to catch an awesome opportunity yeah I agree so networking in 2021 is is going to look a little different. So let's talk a little bit about some things that we should probably expect or ways that we can start to network differently in 2021. So we've talked a little bit about this, but anytime we talk, anytime I've heard networking in the past, I always assume it, it has to be with people I don't already know. So rather than starting with my current network, it was like, well, I have to expand my network. I have to grow it in order to really network with people. But for the environment that we're in right now, I think what we're starting to learn is your current network is really powerful. You've made those relationships for a reason. So why not use the network that you have? So one thing I would encourage you to do, just like what Dylan said, is reach out to some people in your network who maybe you haven't connected with in a while and just ask if how they're doing. It doesn't even have to be a very long um, LinkedIn note to them or a message or text them and just say, hey, do you have 15, 20 minutes to just hop on a call? I'd love to hear how things are in your world and just touch base. 
And most often people are, they're looking for connection. I think Janet, you mentioned that with your daughter, like people want to connect. They just don't know how. And sometimes people aren't very good at reaching out to each other. So take that first step and maybe make a list of 10 clients that, or people that you want to reach back out to that maybe you haven't talked to in a while. And then see if you can just hop on a call for not very even long of a time and just share how, how things have been. People are really open. They want to talk about last year. <laughs> they want to talk about what happened last year and, um, and they don't always have a, a safe place to do that or someone who, who's even interested in listening. So obviously don't go too far down the rabbit hole, but that you could definitely start with your current network. So we're learning how to use social media differently, especially if you weren't part of the millennial generation. Social media was probably limited to maybe some Facebook time and LinkedIn, but the, they're, we're ex expanding into all these different social platforms um, that have different memberships that you can be part of, groups that you can connect with. And, and when you go on social media, go and search for common interests, like things that you're interested in. It doesn't even have to relate to your job. It could be something you just like to do outside of work. Maybe it's a running group, maybe it's a yoga class, maybe it's um, a, a religious community or partnership you can have. What are some interests that you wanna be part of? And then find groups that align with that or even hobbies that you're interested in. You'll, you may find that sometimes your connections to people who are not in a professional network sometimes give you the best leads because they're developing a relationship with you on a personal level and they do want to help you in whatever way they can. Make unsolicited introductions. I, I love to do this when I meet someone or I get connected to someone that um, has a just a fantastic background or they're just really unique or different and they're, they need help in growing their network or making connections with people. Just reaching out to my network and saying, hey, are you open to me making an introduction to this person I just met? I, th their background's really, I think it'd be great for your organization. And most of the time they're like, yes, we're having a hard time finding good people. The job market's just exploding and there's a lot of candidates for every job that's posted out there. And if you get a referral, you're typically more likely to go with the referral than you are scrolling through thousands of resumes for a position. So make unsolicited introductions when you can, and you'll find people will do it back to you. Join a network you're interested in. We've talked a little bit about this, but go out and find, they don't, you just have to be a huge spend, but you may spend a little bit of money on this. And then stay in touch with old and new connections. No sales pitch, just, just true relationship building of, I just want to stay in touch and maybe you make an agreement with certain people that, hey, let's touch base in six months and just see how things are going. And then you, you track that in your calendar or whatever, and you just, you reach back out and you make sure that connection's still there. Just, just to check in and you'll find that the more you keep these relationships warm, um, they, they actually become more powerful and more beneficial than some of the networking stuff we did prior to 2021. Any other thoughts on this? No. Okay. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. We'll get to the birds just really quickly, but questions you can ask. So if you're connecting with someone, let's say you get a referral or a connection on LinkedIn that um, you don't know, and you'd like to schedule some time or just a way to catch up. If you're not very good at starting the dialogue, these are just some questions that you can ask. So obviously if you're in person, you would say what brings you here, but you could just say, you know, hey, can you tell me a little bit about yourself and the work that you do? What's great about what you do? Help me see the positive side of the business you're in or maybe just a personal thing that you have an interest in. Why do you love what you do? People love to talk about what they love. So get them talking about why they love what they do. And you'll see the energy change. Rather than it being this formal conversation, all of a sudden they're like, oh, I love to talk about this. Let me share. And then you, you get nuggets out of that that you would never have gotten before. Who are your best clients? I, I, I see Dan do this on sales calls sometimes with, with referrals you know, what are some of the best organizations that you work with or how can we, you know, expand our reach? Do you have any tips for us on how to do it differently? Just asking for input. It doesn't even have to be a referral into an organization. Just, just getting them thinking about, oh, how could I help you um, grow and expand? 
and potentially how long have you been in business or in the current role that you're in. And then hopefully that's reciprocated back and forth. Well, that's a key question. If, if you ask somebody, what do you love to do and why, and they get all excited about it, do they ask you that in return? And that right there will give you a pretty strong sense of you know, where their head is at. Yeah. All right, any questions or comments before we spend the last couple of minutes just quickly going through how the birds show up in networking? So Janet posted a, a link in the chat um, about something called Lunch Club, just so everyone knows. Looks interesting. Yeah. It, it's been, it's actually been really good. They, they match you up and it's just an online introduction. You can kind of filter it by the kinds of people that you want to meet, what geography. I've met some people around the world actually that, um, mm. that have been interesting. And sometimes it's, it's just fun and sometimes they're there I, I do it so it's just very fun just Boston just business development just you know that but it's 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 kind of cool yeah and I think to that point Janet the what what we're finding is um our what used to be a, a geography based conversation or a location based conversation or networking opportunity we now have this potential when we join these groups to have the world as part of it. I mean, we've seen it expand in ways that we would never have thought connections could look and feel. And it's it's actually brought lots of different ways of thinking and thought leadership into the fold because we, we can now digitally do things together in ways that we didn't think we could before. It's cool stuff. I also feel like we save a lot of time utilizing some of these like online tools and creative mm -hmm. just like digital strategies. Yep. All right, Dan, take it away. Um, okay, so whether you're, we're, we're back in the, what the old world, hopefully new world or resumed world of being in a physical space with somebody or you're on a Zoom call, uh, it's a good idea to remind yourself, okay, what energy do I put out there? So go ahead, uh, Brooke, click the next. So the, the, the clarity that we have in the mirror is, is essential to uh, building healthy relationship because we understand why people respond to us the way they do based on the energy that we put out there. And most of us, you know, have, have a little bit of distortion in the mirror. You know, the person we see is not necessarily the person other people experience. That's natural, that's normal. So to the extent that we pay attention to that, uh, we become more effective in building relationships, especially new ones, especially new ones. So the other piece of that, of course, uh, is recognizing that everybody comes to the table with uh, different combinations of energies. And of course, as you well know, go ahead, Brooke, let's just see them all. Um, we've got eagles, paris, doves, and owls. I don't need to go through, I don't think um, what all that means. I'll, I'll, you know, very briefly, Eagle styles, you know, have a pretty bottom line way of looking at things and they're fairly direct in how they approach uh, any, any type of relationship uh, or, or business goal. And parrots are captivated by what's possible and their behaviors are, are indicative of that. And doves are very sincere in their approach to how they grow their, their, their careers and, and how they build relationships in their personal lives. They're very intentional in what they do and they're careful about how they do it. And owls, uh, owl styles tend to be very rational and analytical in their approach to any type of growth, whether it would be uh, personal or, or professional. And all of us, of course, have these energies uh, co commingling within ourselves. We're all complex, dynamic creatures. And so some of us are eagle parrots or owl dove uh, uh, parrots. Uh, and so to the extent that you have clarity about yourself, again, clarity in the mirror, you can better predict how different types of people will respond to you. Then there's the question of reading other styles or what we call bird watching. And so in a networking environment, what does that look like? Well. First thing you want to think about is when I encounter someone who behaves in these ways, 
They speak quickly, they're brief. They don't hesitate to challenge something you've said, even though they just met you, which might throw you off a little bit. Um, you know, their body language is assertive, they lean forward. When you encounter someone like that, the chances are pretty good that their fundamental energy uh, is in a, in a question, and it's this question. Is this a productive use of my time? Should, am I glad that I'm at this event? Am I glad that I'm talking to you? And if this feels transactional, well, it kind of is, but what, what Eagle Styles do is, is they don't want to waste their time and they sure don't want to waste yours either. And so Eagle Styles or someone who has a lot of Eagle energy has no problem talking to 50 people in a live networking event so that they can identify the three that are worth really talking to, right? And so for an eagle, that's success. Success to talk to a lot of people, identify a couple that, that are worth uh, uh, pursuing and then move, move along. So they're just very goal oriented. So uh, before I move on, does anyone have any questions about this? particular style. Remember, we're all a combination of styles, but if your primary is eagle. By the way, I, I have to share the story. So I'm at a networking event. This is this is years ago. And and I, I happen to catch in the corner of my eye a gentleman that I know is is a major eagle style. Like it's just he's just hardcore. And he's talking to a parrot. Uh, and go ahead, go to the next one, Brooke. Now, I didn't know the person that he was talking to, okay? But it was clear that he was a parrot, okay? Why? Well, because this is how he approached their conversations. Like, oh, a new person, this is awesome. I'm having a new conversation with a new person. And he's bringing all this exaggerated, positive energy to the conversation. I just see this out of the corner of my eye. And what happens? The eagle that I know slowly starts to back away. Like he physically is trying to send the message. I don't want to talk to you anymore. This is not something I'm interested in doing. And so he's literally moving backwards. But the parrot thinks, oh, he wants to keep talking to me over here. And so this person followed the eagle, <laughs> completely clueless to the fact that he was trying to get away from him. Anyway, a little bit of overuse on, on the parrot side there. Um, so what do parrots bring to the table? They bring this and you can identify them as such, whether it's a Zoom call, a lot harder on a Zoom call, by the way, obviously, um, or especially in person. By the way, if you're at a networking event on Zoom and, and people are not, um, uh, uh, they don't have their cameras on, I, I wouldn't take it seriously. You need to be able to see a human being to really take their measure, understand, what moves them. Body language and facial expressions is even more important on Zoom because of the other restrictions that are inherent with the media. So there's no such thing in my view as a networking event where you can't see anybody, where it's everyone's just like busy doing something else while they're supposedly at a networking event. Just a little, little editorial there. Um, but this is what Paris bring to the table. This is how you recognize them. Okay, moving right along. Cause I'm gonna, I've got five minutes. <clears throat> so when people with a lot of dove energy approach a networking event, it's, it's typically with a cautious optimism. They're cautious about it in the sense that meeting a, 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 a gaggle of new people is actually exhausting for, for introverts. It's, it's something they know is important to do, but afterwards they need a, they need a, you know, just chill like read a book, have a drink. Like it, it takes a lot out of them to do that. And that doesn't mean that, that they don't bring great energy to it, they do, but it's more draining. So how can you tell if someone has a lot of dove energy? Well, this is what they give you. They'll typically calmly ask you a lot of, or, or, or at least a few questions about you. They don't tend to open up about themselves first. An eagle style or a parrot style are just talking about themselves. They'll, they'll open that way. You know, here's what I'm about. Here's what I'm excited about. Here's, you know, they, they, they don't hold back. 
but doves are actually interested in you, which is very nice. Um, and their overall demeanor is calm and warm. Um, for a dove style, they don't necessarily want to talk to 50 people and then filter that down to three that are worthwhile. A dove style would rather have <clears throat> one or two genuine conversations. And for a dove style, that is a very successful networking event. And neither um, end of that continuum is, is right or wrong. It's just natural to the person. And go ahead, Brooke. So someone with a lot of owl energy, it, it really is, I, I, have, I admire people with high owl energy that go to networking events because it's so fraught with ambiguity. You don't know if the speaker's gonna be good. You don't know if the people are gonna be good. Yeah, you have to be um, uh, in a contrived way, unusually social. And yet they do it. And I, I just I just have a lot of respect for owls because I know well, that go to network events because I know it's not easy for them. It just isn't. In fact, owls probably prefer the online uh, virtual networking much more. At least the, the high owl styles that I talk to have, have confessed that to me. So you can tell an owl style by the quality of the content that they provide because they tend to give you a lot of really interesting information. You can tell by their tone of voice, which tends to be flat. There's not a whole lot of dynamic range there. Uh, it's not the owl that's gonna talk really loud and then get really quiet. You know, they, they don't do theatrics like that, okay? They're there for information and they're there to share and to help. They're not necessarily there to draw attention to themselves unnecessarily. So to the extent that you can sensitize yourself to the energy people give you, you can then, what we like to say, match the moment, not the mirror, mean lean in their direction. So if I, I'm, I'm a parrot eagle, so I, you know, my cup runneth over. And so if I'm in the presence of an owl dove, I try to be very intentional to pull back the energy, ask more questions, not be so animated, not be as colorful as is natural to me. And then hopefully I walk away without having offended anybody. So to the extent that we are self-aware and then try to lean in the direction of others, we build greater connection. And we build trust at a fundamental level because when you are comfortable with someone's energy, that opens up all kinds of possibilities in terms of what you'll actually share with them as opposed to what you'll hold back. So master moment, not to mirror, lean in, in other people's direction and you're more likely to get what's authentic about them. Now I'll stop there. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. Well, we're at time. And so I just wanted to leave you with three things that we encourage you to go do to start your networking journey of 2021. Um, the first is I encourage you to look at your network and make 10 outreaches in the next two to three weeks of people who, who you haven't talked to or, or interacted with in possibly the last six to 12 months or maybe even longer. And just see if you can get a conversation with them just to start sharing information. Um, make two or three unsolicited referrals. I bet if you start doing some of that, you'll start getting some unsolicited referrals your way too. And then use, use these moments to find a way to share your story. So, so find out what the story is that you wanna tell and then when we can get back in person for these networking events, you'll already be that much farther along than everybody else in the room. If you have any questions or if there's anything else you wanna talk through with Dan or I, feel free to send us an email or connect on LinkedIn if we're not already. Um, but I hope you enjoyed it. If there's any questions, we can stay on for a few moments for a couple of questions, but if not, thank you for your time. And uh, we'll see you on the next one in February. We're, we're still working on the topic, but we'll do our next webinar the first week of February. 
Real quick, Brooke, um, if you guys do apply these tips and tricks and Brooke's challenge, please let us know either on social media or through email and just tell us what works and um, if any of those tips were helpful to you. We'd love to hear it. Yes, we would. Awesome. Great. Well, thanks everyone. Have a great Thank Wednesday. You. Thank you all so Bye. much for hopping on. Thanks Thank for joining you. everybody. Thank you.